This isn't a bad movie, but it is a failed experiment, I would say. It's I I'm glad I finally saw it because I I was I assumed it was just going to be kind of another back to the future nostalgia riff and it was a lot more it was a lot more complicated than that. It is more complicated and the biggest complication is an utterly deranged performance from one Nicolas Cage. I hate to say it, but I it's really true. It's the fatal flaw of the movie. Greetings, loyal listeners and new recruits. I'm Drew Deach. I'm Travis Newton. And this is Genre Vision. Genre Vision is a weekly movie club where we discuss horror films, action movies, fantasy flicks, sci fi cinema, and more. And we continue our genre romance month with Peggy Sue Got Married, directed by Francis Ford Coppola starring Kathleen Turner and Nicolas Cage. Kathleen Turner was actually uh, nominated for an Oscar for this movie. Uh, This is one Travis and I had not seen before, and one I'd I'd always been kind of curious about, uh, because it's a time travel movie. We could have probably done this as an unconventional time travel movie. Uh, And it's very interesting, because I, I, I did not look this up, but I would be shocked to hear that this was not immediately greenlit after the success of Back to the Future, because it's a... A similar story about uh, uh, an individual going back in time to a nostalgic era. This is part of that. You know, there were a whole bunch of of boomer nostalgia movies that came out in the late 70s throughout the 80s, certainly through the 80s a lot. And uh, this one involving Peggy Sue, uh, played by Kathleen Turner, who is going to her 25th uh, high school reunion. And uh, this whole opening sequence where we start with her getting ready for, for the, for the reunion, getting in this big, (laughs) big silvery dress. That's period appropriate for 1960. And, uh, I like, I really liked this entire stretch of the movie where we were learning about the character and the characters, I should say that will uh, make up our ensemble and their relationships and how it had kind of, how how everything it kind of turned out immediately. Like there isn't, I like that the movie didn't start with, well, here's a day in the life of Peggy Sue. And yeah, she, because that's, that's very back to the future. Yeah. It's not like we have to wake up with her. Like we do with Marty McFly and, you know, figure out, Oh, does she have a crummy job that she hate? No, it's, we, we need to know bare bones information. Like, you know, uh, what's her relationship like with her husband? You know, does she have kids? And it gives us this very basic information. And then it does the rest of the first act actually at the um, reunion itself, which is smart. It's a pretty dynamite first act. And it starts off with a really bold filmmaking choice. So it starts off with a shot of a camera looking directly into a mirror. Or is it? As a matter of fact, it's a false mirror shot where they actually had uh, the camera pointed at Kathleen Turner and Helen Hunt, who is helping her get ready, who plays her daughter. Right. The The camera is actually pointed over the shoulder, looking at the back of a Kathleen Turner double who is mirroring every movement. And you can spot subtle differences in their actions and stuff like that if you're really looking for it. But the illusion, and they, they actually do this twice in the movie, the, the illusion of the whole false mirror gag is beautifully pulled off. It is a, a pretty stunning way to open up the movie, I thought. Well, I'll say that the fact that they do it twice and it's the bookends feels like a thematic choice. Um, one about, because the, the, the movie is about reflection. It's about reflecting on your past. And the whole idea is that, yeah, Peggy Sue doesn't really like how her life turned out. She married her high school boyfriend, played by Nicolas Cage. They're in the process or at least about to just start getting a divorce. Um, as she says, it, she tells her friends that uh, I, I got to say, uh, the, for, first and foremost, the cast in this movie is phenomenal, like unbelievable aces. Uh, I mean, when, when you have people like Catherine Hicks and Joan Allen playing what essentially are very minor supporting roles. Holy crap. Oh, Jim Carrey playing a minor supporting role. Yeah. Uh, it. Sophia Coppola shows up uh, and, and, you know, it's it's the, the director's daughter. And you have Nick Cage, who's the who's Sophia Coppola's cousin. So, yeah, I mean, it's always a family affair with them. But I mean, that aside, incredible cast. Well, I mean, let's let's highlight the best surprise we got from the cast, which is introducing Kevin J. O'Connor. 
Hell yes. So he, in a total surprise, plays like the... uh, He's the beat poet. The sort of like outcast beat poet uh, in high school that she barely remembers. And I don't think he shows up at the reunion because he wouldn't be the kind of person to do that. Well, no, they, they, there's a big there's a big photo of him because he ran track at the reunion and all the girls are sitting around like, "Ooh, do you know what happened to I don't have his name pulled up right now, but they're like, "Ooh, do you know what happened to him? And they're like, yeah, I couldn't get in touch with them. Don't know. Like, it's a total mystery. We don't know where he is in 1985. Mm-hmm. And so then when she, when Peggy Sue eventually goes back into the past, we get to see him and he is it's like all we saw was this guy running track photo uh this giant photo they had blown up but it turns out yeah he's this very beatnik you know talking about uh, Kerouac and stuff like that and calling out Hemingway as a phony it's uh, and most importantly to us framing Kevin J O'Connor the man who we came to know from movies like Deep Rising and The Mummy as a true heartthrob it's yeah it's a pretty remarkable choice the one thing we haven't talked about is that Nicolas Cage's character by the time 1985 rolls around is in a really bad marriage with Kathleen Turner. And he's also famous. We first see him on TV hosting. I forget exactly what it is. Some kind of TV show or some sort of advertisement. He took over his dad's appliance business and he's like crazy Charlie's discount prices. And so what we find out is that yes, when he was, when he was in high school, he was trying to, he was part of this basically doo-wop group um, and he wanted to be a singer. Uh, but clearly when we, when we're introduced to him, his, his character's name is Charlie, Charlie Bedell. Um, when we're introduced to him, he is just some kind of wacko appliance. I don't even know if it's necessarily appliances. It's just like electronics or something. I, I, it's deceptive because it seems like he has some degree of kind of like fame to him. It's local fame. Yeah, I, I suppose. But like the, there, it seems to be that there's some sort of money there. And when he shows up at the um, the reunion, he shows up sort of fashionably late. And there's this great reveal where we follow a balloon as it drifts upward toward the ceiling. And as it you know drifts upward, there's this door at the top of a set of stairs that comes into frame and then cage bursts through the door. It's like, ah, that's a really well uh, orchestrated entrance for him. I doesn't even, I don't even necessarily say burst, but when he opens it, there's a great shaft of light that's backlighting him. So he's almost in silhouette. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, remember this is directed by Francis Ford Coppola. So the guy can make a pretty decent looking movie. I've heard. Uh, no shit. Um, yeah. On a, on a technical level, like it's immediately impressive. I mean, just that first mirror shot alone, you know, you're in for something like, oh, okay. On a technical level, this is going to be not your standard rom-com or even your standard sort of, you know, time travel story. But even, even beyond, I would say that the, with, with one or two exceptions, some of those being those fake mirror shots, the filmmaking is not overly flashy most of the time. No, uh, it's, it's extremely well composed and, and cognizant of the kind of emotions and perspectives that it's trying to put you into, but it's it's rarely being as flashy as those one or two moments that we mentioned. Right. It's not an um, effects film, I would say. Um, no, there's not certainly at all. there's certainly effects in it. You know, like when um, Peggy Sue is, I don't know, she's elected, I guess, the queen of the the reunion. You know, along with some other smarty pants guy that was in her class, and then. Um, That's I an important Richard, character. Rich, Richard Norvik, yeah. Um, mm, played by Barry Miller. So um, she, as she is elected queen and she sees this big cake being wheeled towards her and all these candles on it, she has some sort of fainting spell and there is this really strongly executed bit of social horror as the sound is drowned out and you know she feels all the eyes on her. And, you know, and psychedelic horror too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it's very strongly... Um, executed in that sense it's just scary i I really felt like uh uh-oh this isn't good and then she wakes up in 1960 and i love i i love this because as opposed to back to the future this is not a sci-fi movie it's not interested in time travel as rules it is just hey what if you got to go back to your senior year of high school what would you do differently because she outright says that in the first act like oh if i could go back i'd do things so differently you know, I wouldn't get together with Charlie, you know, these kinds of things. And she's given that opportunity and she realizes I'm back in 1960 and Kathleen Turner is working in this movie. Like I, I, she is doing such great work by 
being really fun. She has so many lines where she's outright like telling people like, yeah, she's not outright telling them, but she's, you know, to us, the audience, we know she's talking about that. She's from the future and she knows what's going on and all this stuff. She she's treating people like she hasn't seen them in forever. Like when she first sees uh, her little sister played by Sofia Coppola gives her a big hug and everything. Um, you know, she says stuff like her, like her, her dad, her dad buys an Edsel. Yeah. And she laughs in his face. Very funny joke. Yeah. Well, she, she, she comes out and he's like, ta-da, look at it. And she's like, oh dad, you were always doing things like this. And she cracks up. She's like, you bought an Edsel, which is such a, such a, nobody's going to get that joke today. who's not over the age of like 30. Yeah. yeah, And it is, it is like that boomer (laughs) nostalgia joke. And it's a really well-written one. So I'm into that, but the, the way that she is playing a 43 year old woman in an 18 year old's body is so fantastic that it makes you kind of forget that they didn't age anybody down. All these actors are not aged down with makeup or effects. They just are, they're put in the costumes and the magic really is in the performance. Well, the the thing is they age them up in the first act during the, 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 the reunion. Like they had, it's like, Oh, they give them some, but it's not, it's not, you know, like makeup makeup. It's like, yeah, they gray their hair a little bit. And, you know, uh, some of them maybe have a little less hair, like, like the, uh, Richard Norvik character. It's like, oh yeah, he's got a mustache and grayer hair. So now when we see him as when he's younger, it's like, yeah, he just doesn't have gray hair or a mustache. Right. Yeah. But it's not like they put old age stipple on anybody when they were in, you know, the 1985 time. And there's some, I mean, I mean, it's it's very subtle. It's very subtle. The stuff they do. Well, with some exceptions, Nicholas Cage, they did, uh, some work. Well, nothing is subtle about Nicholas Cage's persona in this film. Let's break it open. Let's just get there. So he, here is here's the thing about this movie for me, and I hate to I hate to focus all this attention on him because that's part of the problem with the movie. Mm-hmm. He's stealing focus from Turner by making all of these wild choices, and then he has Francis, a family member, directing him and not appropriately reining him in. No, he he's clearly being encouraged in so many ways. I mean, and this is historically from what we looked up an issue with this movie. It's like, Oh, and it was an issue between him and Turner. Um, in that Nicholas cage decided to wear false, like these weird false upper teeth and put on this really nasally, you called it like a helium voice uh-huh. and his, and his particular Nicholas cage jerkiness is really turned up to like nine or 10. It's a performance that as written should not really be this off the wall. Well, I felt like when we see that brief clip of him on TV in the first scene, I thought, okay, we're going to see how a kid became this cartoon, right? But no, it turns out Cage is still playing him as the same cartoon, just like with more kid energy. And it is, it's stunning. Like there are some choices that he makes that are like really funny and really watchable playing Charlie. But then there are other choices where I'm just like, this detracts from the movie. This confuses me. I don't know what you're doing. I would call it a wholly fascinating performance, but mostly for the wrong reasons. It's something where it's like, yeah, this these are these are things that I think nowadays people would just kind of expect. It's like, yeah, Nicolas Cage being wacky. And it's like, yeah, but in in those instances when it works, like like in something like Mandy, it's suited to the material and the tone. Like well, it, and and I, there's it's, it's to be said that Nick Cage as a performer has aged beautifully. Oh, he's yeah. He's only gotten better here. Evidently, you know what, from what Kathleen Turner has said in her 2008 memoir, I think it was, he had a lot of issues in terms of production. And, and there's some of that that is disputable because Nick Cage actually sued her for defamation on several claims in that. And he won. So it means that, you know, there's information in that book that could have hurt his career. Well, I mean, let's be honest. Nicholas Cage has demonstrated behavior that has put his career in jeopardy. Well, let, let's 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 step away from the the outsidedness of this and just say it's like who cares? Like I don't care what really happened. What's left is what's on the screen, and what's on the screen is an actor trashing what should actually be a more. Uh, there should be more in concert between the two of them. And anytime Turner and Cage are together, it's the Nicholas Cage show. Yeah. He tries to steal focus and upstage her in like every scene they have together, 
when his job as a performer is to support her as the lead. And she was signed on to the movie before he was. Well, also narratively, it hurts the movie because the whole, without getting into specifics of story, but I will kind of make a big picture arc thing here is that the point of the movie as a, and I like this in opposition to back to the future is that, you know what the nostalgia and what you think you would do differently, you wouldn't actually do because that's the way things were. And that's, that's made you the person you are. And there's a level of acceptance and, and a really mature acceptance that comes at the end of the movie with that. But that is all dependent on us actually believing that Peggy Sue and Charlie should maybe be together. And Cage's performance derails any of that potential intimacy and closeness and warmth. Yeah, he just seems like a wacky asshole. Yeah, it's it's th- by the end of the movie, I won't say specifically what happens just yet, but by the end of the movie, we're supposed to believe it's like, you know what, maybe, maybe they'll get back together and that's the way it should be. Not with the character that we saw. It, it it's it's like no, don't get back together with him. Like it undercuts the the whole theme of the movie, mm-hmm. which is supposed to be like no, your nostalgia like your nostalgia was wrong. Like things wouldn't have been better. Right. Like be you, your own person. You know, don't let this path that's been laid out for you. You know, hold you back. I mean, really, Charlie is such a terrible thing in the movie that I, I just wish that the movie would take sort of an alternate pathway, but then it means losing the Helen Hunt character as her daughter that she had with Charlie. And I'm like, well, I know one thing about this movie and is that she's eventually going to have to find her way back to 1980 and Helen Hunt's going to be there. That's the only thing I feel like that's going to happen for sure in this movie. Cause otherwise like the plot is structured in this very zigzag fashion where I was like, I don't, I don't exactly know what's happening here. Well, here, here's the, as a time travel movie, there are ramifications to the time travel, but it's not really about that. Like, and that's, that's one of the things I liked. It was like, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to see anybody disappearing from photographs and stuff like that. That's not what I'm here for. That back to the future did that wonderfully. And it's, that's its take this one. While we do find out that some very small things changed, uh, by her going back in time, it wasn't anything that truly changed your life because what happens is you think the movie is going to be, Hey, I've got a second chance. I'm going to do things differently. You know what? That hunky beaten it kid. I'm going to go off with him and I'm going to go ride his bicycle and listen to him recite bad poetry and make out with Kevin J. O'Connor. And that happens. And you're like, oh, well, like maybe that's what, you know, maybe this is the back to the future thing where she's going to go back and all of a sudden she has a big Ford truck and everything like, you know, (laughs) but it's not. She she goes off uh, with Kevin J. O'Connor. They have a night at the lake and they talk about, you know, the future and things like that. And they sleep together. And then Peggy Sue has this really mature realization of like, yeah, we're not going to be together. Like we had a really fun time and we had one night and her, and her seed is that she says, you know, we had a really fun time and maybe you'll write about it one day because he wants to be this writer, but that that's all it was. And that's okay. And it's beautiful. And they both come to this really mature understanding of like, yeah, That was nice. Like, it was a good thing for both of us. This is a premise, this whole premise of, like, if you could go back to high school, like, would you do it all over again? It's it's ripe for narrative potential. Because, you know, I've had these thoughts, too. I think all of us have had fears of, like, did I... Did I peak in high school? Well, and there's plenty of movies that, you know, play on this kind of, if you could go back. Sure. It's a bit of a wish fulfillment thing. Yeah. Yeah. But what I like is that the movie, it, it... it kind of acknowledges like, well, if you if you really want to believe in that stuff, you have to get to a really wacky, bizarre place, which is where the movie eventually goes in its in its climax, which I was not expecting. Mm-hmm. But that its theme is like, no, like if you went back and experienced these things, you'd actually most likely come to the same conclusions because that was that was your life in that moment. Yeah, I know. And I'm sure that there are plenty of people in their own experiences who would do it all differently. And I, for that, I don't blame them. You know, this is the reason that we have these kind of, you know, thematic explorations and storytelling It's like people do entertain thoughts of like, man, I really wish I could rewrite it. But I think the the story that it tries to write for Peggy Sue is one that really attempts a natural conclusion. But there are some things standing in the way of that with, with the way this movie is constructed. And we we've talked about Nicolas Cage being the big one, like it, the whole character just stands in the way of us actually believing that Peggy Sue should wind up with him. The other thing 
that is entirely unrelated to that is that the the story takes a very strange and um almost like Cohen Brothers esque pathway through Peggy Sue's past to find these conclusions because it, it's not structured like a um you know for instance with Back to the Future I mean that the structure of that movie is just fucking solid you know you know when plot beats are going to fall you kind of know where they're landing you know what the stakes are at any given time you feel a great sense of urgency this has to happen by this point and the lightning's going to strike the tower and oh yeah I mean, has, you know you got to prevent your family from disappearing from the photograph or you know whatever it is as a piece of me- and i don't say this dismissively as a piece of mechanical writing back to the future is a is a perfect pocket watch it's one of the things that makes it one of the best blockbusters of the 80s but this it's more about an emotional journey yeah it's less about mechanics it's more about like what brings peggy sue to the point where she's ready to let go of 1960 that that's part of it certainly um we get to a, a certain point we're, we're definitely skipping around a lot but it was cert- it was the point that really hit home for me even more than the climax is earlier in the movie uh peggy sue's at her house and she gets a call from her grandmother and it's this moment of like, oh, my gosh, grandma, like I didn't she, we've never heard about her grandma at this point. There's been no mention of her. But at, when this phone call happens, Peggy Sue relates like, oh, my gosh, like it's so good to hear your voice. Like I, you're you're here because in 1985, her grandma's dead. Yeah. Well, she she freaks out. She's not able to actually talk to her grandmother at first. She's like, I'll, I'll have to talk to you later. And that was. A moment where they again they they sort of re-explored the horror of like what would it be like to be back in the past and you can talk to the dead like it's not going to be it's not going to be an easy thing it it reminded me of the way that I feel when I wake up having dreamed of a dead family member it's creepy it's a creepy feeling well and and the movie knows it because as she starts to realize like what am I actually doing here and and what am I gain like what's the point of being here. Like, uh, is anything actually really changing? She goes to visit her grandparents. Mm-hmm. And and this has the spookiest and the most uh, powerful moment in the movie for me, in which she's only told, uh, uh, what's his nuts? Uh, Richard, uh, that she's a time trip. Uh, yeah, Richard Norvig. Yeah. Because she, when when they meet each other in the, uh, in the reunion, Richard says, like, you were always nice to me. Like, everybody else treated me like a jerk, and now I'm super rich because I'm an inventor and things like this. And then when she goes back in time, she singles him out because it's like, oh, you're really smart. I'm going to tell you I'm from the future, and here's how I know it. And so she's always, like, very comically feeding him inventions that he can create to be super famous. Um, but if eventually she gets to this this place where she decides to go visit her grandparents and then she tells them and uh, they immediately believe her. Like it, the, the grand, grandmother says like, if you believe it, honey, I believe it. And then, and so then there's this wonderful moody exploration of, well, what does it actually mean? And her grandmother says, you're browsing through time. It gave me chills. Yeah. Well, it's, it, it hits the nail on the head. We all have the ability to time travel. It's memory. Mm-hmm. Memory is time travel. And that's the thing. What she's remembering in this time travel, it's not what really happened, but it also is because that's what memory is. Mm-hmm. Memory is a story we tell ourselves based on facts we we hold to be true, but our memory is imperfect. Our memory is not what probably what, what actually really happened because there's way too many factors that we can't think about, but we remember how something felt. And this moment when she says you're browsing through time, it hits on the head. Like, yeah, I'm just remembering how I would like to remember things. And that's not good. It's Mm -hmm. not good for me. And then it's revealed that her grandfather is part of a secret society. That's been waiting for a time traveler. Uh, (laughs) Fucking so out of left field, like this left turn again, it felt, it felt like a, it felt like a plot beat from a Coen brothers movie. We're like, what? Mm -hmm. Um, so Peggy Sue drives with her granddad out to this like lodge, um, (laughs) where, where her grandfather's father's in some like fraternal order of like weirdos who dress up in robes and have rituals and shit. <laughs> there's, there's the, I love it because uh, Peggy Sue's like, what What do you tell grandma that you do here? Like, what does she think you do here? And he's like, watch stag films and play poker. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so funny. And the, the costumes of the guys when they're standing there is very, very funny. Um, and then 
is it David Carradine shows up? Who's the which John Carradine? Carradine is it? Yeah. John Carradine. Sorry, yeah, John Carradine shows up for very old and shows up for a cameo. He's the um, Grand High Poobah. <laughs> yeah, and so they they do this ritual to I don't know send her back to where she came from, and there's a big lightning strike, and you might think, ooh, spooky, and she disappears, and you're like, really? Was that it? No, turns out fucking Charlie, this crazy asshole has abducted her again and takes her into some nearby greenhouse during the storm. And here they have this big sort of, you know, knockdown drag argument, but he finally manages to win her over with this locket, which is used as this, you know, device throughout the movie to, to signify like what she loves the most really. Yeah. It's not even really throughout it. It's set up in the first act during the reunion and she shows the lock and they're like, Oh, I, you know, all their friends like, I remember when you were so excited to get that locket from Charlie and she opens it up And you would think, oh, well, it's going to be a picture of her and Charlie. And it's like, no, it's our kids. Like, these are the things I love the most. Because when she starts to really crumble down about the time travel, she says, like, I miss my kids. Like, I don't Mm want to be here anymore. Yeah. Um, And so when Charlie gives her the locket, she opens it up. She's like, oh, it's it's our, you know, it's our kids' names or whatever they are. I can't remember. And then Charlie's like, who who are Dana and John? That's us as kids. Mm -hmm. Yep. And and it should be this moment of ah this they are supposed to be together like they their love has transcended what their belief in time is to the point where it it's it's beautifully cyclical that does not work because Charlie sucks in every way such a dick such a dick there there's one scene that really turns the tide on him like there is like throughout the first half of the movie you think like oh this guy could maybe be like a lovable weirdo dweeb. But then he sneaks into Peggy Sue's bedroom one night and is sitting on her bed while she's asleep. And he raises a pillow to her face as if to smother her. Yeah, I I I, my read on that is that I believe it's supposed to be darkly comic because the whole reason he's upset is that he hears that she's going with Kevin J. O'Connor and is and maybe at that point has even slept with him. Um and that's they're trying to make it, you know, bizarrely a sympathetic, dark, comedic moment. But it does not play like that, especially coming from the performance that Cage has been giving throughout the movie. It it reads as like, holy shit, he he was about to kill her like that. Screw this guy. Yeah. And then he and then he dra- basically like drags her down into the basement where it is clearly freezing cold because you can see both of the actors breath. And Kathleen Turner is standing there in her PJs, like clearly freezing her ass off while he's like losing his shit and i'm just like fuck this guy i want him to get hit by a bolt of lightning like, well because i mean I, he's he's talking about his dreams about being a singer and how they're gonna have this future and then he's you know it's like well you know screw you. i'm gonna do this i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna be this big singer and i'm gonna be popular and yada yada, yada. like you know trying to give her a big i'm gonna leave you behind speech and it again it's a moment that if better acted should be where we actually feel sympathy for Charlie where it's like, yeah, he's somebody like Peggy Sue's whole journey has been. I want to fulfill my dreams, my hopes and screw everybody else. It's all about me. This should be a moment where we're like, yeah, Charlie's a human being and her presence in, in his life of has affected him, Mm -hmm. but screw him. Like, cause Nicholas cage plays it. So unlikable. And there's another moment where she's out in a diner with Kevin J O'Connor and it turns out that uh, Charlie is moonlighting there as a singer and and she sees him and she's like, wow, he's he's really good. Like, he's great. I forgot, like, you know, I, I forgot how good he was. And she's like, I never saw this side of you where, you know, you were because the song he's singing is, you know, so it's like he'll, he'll never love you like I love you. Yes. And we see him. We see him also um, playing with black musicians. So we're seeing these sort of like different versions and sides of him. There's also a really important scene after this where we we actually have a scene from charlie's perspective where he's sitting across from like a talent scout or a manager you know potential manager prospect and he gets turned down um and so it's it's something where we're supposed to really sympathize with him but yeah the, the the as written those moments are all there and if played correctly they should work but cage kamikazes the role i hesitate to use like really hyper like hyperbolic language to describe stuff like this but it's I think a disastrously bad choice for this movie because pretty much everything else that's going on is pretty damn good. Mm -hmm. You know, even I could forgive the sort of structural 
weirdness or some of the structural amorphousness of the movie, if Charlie was better rendered as a character and it would take a different performance. Well, if the central romance worked, because yeah. the central romance should be about them and should be about, you know what? Peggy Sue got to have her, her fling down memory lane and do things a little differently, but she came around to realizing like, no, the decisions I made were right. And maybe Charlie and I can work things out because it, it, in the end, uh, after being abducted by Charlie, uh, and taken to the greenhouse and having this moment where they break down. She's like, oh, Charlie, you know, it's uh, I love you. It was always you, all this. It comes across totally false. And then we jump back and she's waking up from fainting uh, at the reunion dance. And Charlie's there and he's, you know, looking at, well, no, they're not at the dance. They're at the hospital because she fainted. And Charlie's right there at her bedside. And he's like, you know, I've been here ever since. Like, you know, I've been sitting right here. And it, it should be that moment of like, oh, yeah, like he's, yeah, he he might like as written. Yeah, he was kind of an asshole, but he's not a bad guy like and he's and clearly through time and age has changed and is and, and is capable of change. But this whole ending where, you know, Helen Hunt comes in and is like, OK, mom, you're all right. And Peggy Sue is like, you know, maybe maybe we could have dinner this week. And that's it. I as written. I like that the movie doesn't end on, you know, they are 100% back together. It's just, yeah, I don't think they've, I don't think they've earned that. So I'm glad that the movie knows it. No, the movie knows it, but the movie is, knows that it needs to end on the possibility of reconciliation. Like, and it's like, okay, maybe they do, maybe they don't, but they're going to make the choice and try together. But screw that. Like, don't care. Don't want it from this version of Charlie. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a bummer because yeah, I, I, I mostly liked Peggy Sue. Uh, I actually liked kind of the weird structuralness about it because it felt when, because when it was punctuated by that, you're browsing through timeline. It was like, ah, that's what this has been. It's not, it's not really a, we're trying to build, uh, you know, uh, structurally in a, in a usual sense to particular climaxes and moments. Cause when I, I messaged you, I was like, oh my God, there's like 13 minutes left in this. What, what? Yeah, and I had no clue where it was going. It was like, what could possibly fucking happen? Well, I was just like, how are we here? Like this, this is bizarre. Like I don't, I this doesn't feel like a climax. Um, right. It didn't feel like we had a proper low point to end the second act to bring us into the third act. You know, it just it hadn't felt like we had. You know, there, there was. I mean, the low yeah. point really feels like where it's Charlie and her. You know, that that talk in the basement is essentially the low point where it's like, all right, they're done. Like mm-hmm. their future together has been completely shattered. But I I, I liked it as a refutation. So I, well, it's not a total refutation of nostalgia, but it's more so about if you if you only think about the past, you really don't have a future. You're going to be stuck in the past. Yeah. And and I think that's always I think that's a good thematic lesson, one I agree with. But it also argues for the value of nostalgia as well. Sure. I mean, it's it says that these people were important and, you know, an important part of uh, of Peggy Sue's life. They still are, you know, when they get together in the reunion, she has her friends. Catherine Hicks and Joan Allen. And uh, it says, it's like, yes, this, these, these things in these moments were important, but you can't stay in them. That's, mm-hmm. that's when the grandma like directly says to her, like, you, you can't fucking stay here. Like it's you you, this is bad. And the realization Peggy Sue, you know, that Peggy Sue has of, yeah, as, as much as it was a fun fling to come back here, it's not what I actually want. And, and that's, again, an extremely difficult and mature place. But for a genre romance month, man, this whiffed the ball hard and it's all on one person's shoulders. Yeah, and I would really love to see this movie made with somebody who understood how important the Charlie role is in well, not, helping not, define the movie. I mean, not, not, not just how important, but what their role actually is. It's true. Be, yeah. Because Cage... Cage thinks the Charlie role is incredibly important, the most important. Right. And that's the problem. It's like, no, you're, you are a supporting role. You're there, you know, you're your own character. And that's why we get moments that really showcase uh, his perspective on his own and, and have us feel sympathy for him. But the weirdo affectations that he put on and then just his entire attitude in the role does not make Charlie the... These in some ways, like Charlie is the antagonist of the movie. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I really felt that way through quite a lot of the running time. Well, he's supposed to be because the, the 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 start of the movie is her saying like we're getting a divorce, and so when she goes back in time, her immediate thing is like I don't want to be with Charlie. Yeah, like screw like this guy screwed up my life. So it's like, yeah, any incursion he makes into her life in 1960, we're immediately like, get out of there. No, you you told us you don't want to be with this guy. He ruined your life. But then through the course of the story, we realize like, actually, he's a person with his own hopes and dreams. He has sympathy in him. And the life that they did end up making together is one that she wanted and is valuable and is at least worth trying for. But you cannot you cannot invest in that because of the way Cage plays the role. and. Part of the reason that Cage's actions or at least Cage's performance in the movie don't really live up to the rest of the movie is because it means the director didn't have a solid enough idea of what the story should be to make it work. And it should be noted that this is not one of Francis Ford Coppola's babies. He was kind of a hired gun on this. He was he was not the first director signed on to this project. No, they, they weren't the first actors. This was a a, a working job um, yeah. as far as a film goes. So. I think it was an opportunity to give Cage some serious profile. Uh, and I think that backfired horrifically. <laughs> um, I don't know why Francis couldn't direct Nicolas Cage to do what the movie needed. I mean, did Francis even know what the movie needed? Did he care? Or did he um, enable? I mean, I mean, it yeah, seems like did he, he enabled, enabled Cage. Yeah. I mean, that from from the finished product we have, that is my my gut feeling is like he let him do this. I mean, he compare that, compare that to back to the future where Bob Zemeckis was like, look, Eric Stoltz, you're not working out. Yeah. I'll cut an actor. Cause you're not doing, well. I'll cut the lead, the yeah. lead <laughs> Eric Stoltz. Who's a good actor. Yeah. Just watch Anaconda. Um, <laughs> <laughs> his greatest performance. Uh, <laughs> Fly two is actually, is yeah. Actually so, yes, it is his greatest you. performance. I was just, you know, he spends most of Anaconda on a bed. <laughs> Cause he sw- I swallowed a bug. Yeah. yeah. I swallowed a bug and I needed John Voight to perform a tracheotomy on me. Um, <laughs> so, but Kathleen Turner uh, totally earned her Oscar nomination. She's great in this. So good. Uh, that moment where she decides she's going to drink. Oh my God. And she's, she's 18. She's like 43. She's like, I need, <laughs> I need a fucking drink. She goes right to her dad's liquor cabinet and, you know, pulls the, the stopper out of the decanter or whatever it is. And she starts sucking that stuff down. Well, cause, cause when, that's, that's pretty early on when she's time travel back and she's like, and she starts pouring the drink. She's like, whatever. I'm probably dead anyways. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah Kathleen Turner's deadpan delivery on that. Is oh, she's awesome. so, she's so funny. She's great. Um, you know who else is really good in the movie is Joan Allen. Oh yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. A, a wonderful background player. I love Catherine Hicks. She's so bubbly and fun. Yep. Um, love seeing. I, I was like, where the hell have I seen her? I was like, Oh, she's the lead in child's play. Duh. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, uh, I don't have the actress name, but the actress that plays the one, like, a uh, school journalist newspaper person who's like super gossipy and always throwing shade. Yeah. Dolores Dodge is played by Lisa Jane Persky. Yeah. Yes. When, 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 when Peggy Sue empties the, the, ink pen on her and she's like oh these pins you know they're so uncontrollable <laughs> it's it's great it's like ah oh, you got to go back and get one on your bully i love you know? in the in the opening where she asks how do you feel about missing out in the sexual revolution she asked joke. that to joan allen and her husband because it's like oh they, they were high school sweethearts that married yeah and it's like yeah. They, yeah, yeah you feel about missing out that's great no it's it's got so much good in it it's just that one thing it really is that it casts that big of a shadow on the movie. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a bummer, but I'm still, I'm still very glad we watched it and had more, you know, more of a good time with it than not. Yeah. Um, It's, I mean, it's just especially disappointing now in this era where we're like having this Nick Cage Renaissance where like, he's so good and a bunch of stuff and we want to appreciate the best of what he does. But then you watch a movie like this and you're like, he's made some bad choices. Woo. But you know what? That's important. It's important to do that. Like there are other Nicolas Cage movies from the eighties that I've, I'm interested in seeing. Maybe we'll do them on the show one day. Sure. Um, because it's like Nicolas Cage, he was always wacky, but the, it took time. I think for him to re- like kind of fit into the right kind of character roles that, that we now know him for. Mm-hmm. We're going to do con. We're going to do con air later this year, for instance, which I've never seen, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm stoked to see that. I think that's, you know, I think that's one where the uh, the material will probably fit his particular quirks more. Um, but, you know, go watch Pig. 
Uh, that's that's if you take anything away from our Peggy Sue got married episode, go watch Pig. That would be an excellent shelf pick if we had it as a shelf pick. But I know it's not this week's shelf pick uh, for either of us. So I think this presents a good opportunity to head to the shelf. The shelf is a uh, collaborative zone. Uh, you can use the shelf to pull off a movie and recommend it to us for uh, this episode. Uh, we can pull movies off our shelves to recommend as sort of like pairings or substitutions. Uh, what you can do if you want to be a participant in this whole shelf thing is go to genrevision.com, find the post for this episode on the main page, leave your shelf pick in the comment, and we'll actually read it on next week's episode. Uh, Drew, what are you pulling off the shelf for Peggy Sue Got Married? Well, I would say that a major influence on Peggy Sue Got Married is The Wizard of Oz. Oh, yeah. Uh, very. I mean, very clearly, it's a there's no place like home ending, you know, with time travel. It's about going to essentially a, a fantasy world. There are uh, some literal like yellow brick sidewalks in this. Sure, sure. Yeah. So my shelf pick is going to be another Nicolas Cage movie that directly pulls from The Wizard of Oz. This is Wild at Heart, directed by David Lynch. Uh, this is, I feel a David Lynch movie that does not get talked about enough. Uh, I think it's at this point, kind of a, kind of one of the deeper cuts of his filmography. And that's a shame. Now, granted it's a David Lynch movie. So it's got that kind of, you know, meditative psychedelic vignettiness to it, to, to it. It's not quite as concise and well-structured as something like blue velvet, um, the story being it's Nicolas Cage and Laura Dern and they're two lovers and they're on the run because Laura Dern's mom has hired like weirdos to try and kill Nicolas Cage because she doesn't want her daughter with him. Um, one of the uh, I, one of the weirdos in the movie ends up being Willem Dafoe in a absolutely grotesque performance that the, the fake teeth they have on him are terrifying. Um <laughs> But there's there's even dr- more terrifying than his real teeth. <laughs> yeah, no, for it's you, if you've never seen what he looks like in Wild at Heart, Google that. It's gross. Uh, it's it's icky and uh, disturbing, like most David Lynch stuff. But there are some very direct uh, Wizard of Oz uh, uh, mentions. Uh, you will see Glenda the Good Witch's bubble in this movie. Uh, it's it's as the title states, wild. Uh, it's it's fun. It's I mean, it's fun and and as much as a David Lynch movie can be fun, uh, but it's it's a role where the the especially for a romance, like the central romance of these two very star crossed, wild, bizarre people. It works with Nicolas Cage still doing his big Nicolas Cage stuff. Uh, It's I don't know if you have you ever seen Wild at Heart? I haven't. Ooh, okay, I got that on the back burner because good good I, Let's I, do that I, one. I, i've not revisited in a long time but i remember i remember being pretty hot on it when i saw it so well, I mean, wild at heart is my shelf pick travis what are you going to pull off the shelf for peggy sue got married i didn't actually know you were going to pull a david lynch movie off the shelf until just now so i'm a little blindsided because my shelf pick is mulholland drive yeah we there's there's more than a little lynchiness in peggy sue no question so this sort of idyllic suburbia It reminded me a little bit of um, the ending of Blue Velvet, uh, Mm -hmm. where the robins come back and the the sun is shining down in the streets of Lumberton. Um, But really what what struck me about this was, you know, using this sort of like alternate reality, this past to explore who you really are, sort of like a different version of the self and, you know, all this like surrealness of the past. Like I, I really couldn't stop thinking about Mulholland Drive. Um, and Naomi Watts is sort of like wide eyed, um, taking it all in, you know, this, this like experience sponge, like soaking up the weirdness that is LA, um, in this movie and the eventual turn, uh, it's tough to know whether or not I should spoil it here. The eventual turn and what happens in like how reality sort of flips you know it's been described as like a mobius strip reality where it's just like endlessly rotating loop where one side is twisted and you know the it continues to rotate around and around but on the other side of the loop all of the actors play different characters and this happens really late in the movie and it's like what the fuck's going on here so some of the twists and turns you know it, it reminded me of cohen stuff it reminded me of lynch stuff um but i could not get mulholland drive out of my head Particularly, you know, with the location as well, it being set in Southern California in this film, I just thought, oh my God, I have to watch Mulholland again. 
that flipping, you know, that's Lynch has such a fascination with duality. Mm-hmm. Um, he does, you know, like Lost Highway, the protagonist turns into another person halfway through. Or realities within realities. Yeah, you know? I mean, uh, th- th- there's a reason why he called his show Twin Peaks. Mm-hmm. Like, he he's very much about that. And I think that he likes to use actual dual, you know, doppelgangers and things like that to explore something similar to, as to what's going on in Peggy Sue. It's like, yeah, what if you could be a different version of yourself? Like it, that's, you know, you, it's you, but a different you. And what does that mean? Like, what is exactly, what does that mean to yourself, your sense of self? Um, yeah. I mean, it's been a long time since I've watched Mulholland drive. So, uh, that might be another one. It's, are, are we leaning towards David Lynch month? Um, <laughs> We, I don't think you and I could do a whole month of David Lynch. I don't think that's possible. It, I, I think, I think we could, I think we could very carefully curate because the other one I would want to do would be the straight story. Okay. Yeah. That would probably be an easier one. Yeah. yeah I've never seen that. So, um, and then we'll crush ourselves with the elephant man. <laughs> it's just an absolutely soul crushing movie. But, I mean, a damn good one though. Oh, fan, I mean, an absolute classic. Um, so anyway, yeah, that's what I'm pulling off the shelf, uh, this week. For Peggy Sue Got Married. Go watch David Lynch movies is what we're saying. Yeah. Uh, Well, now we will head over to the listener shelf picks for last week's episode on Starman. Eric Johnson went with The Day the Earth Stood Still from 1951. Go listen to our Day the Earth Stood Still episode. It's a pretty good episode, actually. It is. Uh, Mr. Milksteak went with Midnight Special, uh, which is a movie that you and I both mentioned when we were watching it. And The Alien Factor from 1978, uh, which was apparently made in like 1972 and then sat on the shelf for six years. So I don't know what that is. I'm intrigued. Uh, Eric Fuchs, God bless him, went with Extro. Uh, go listen to our Extro mo- uh, episode and watch Extro if you can stomach it, because <laughs> we, we're big Extro boosters. Uh, Pale Fire went with The Last Starfighter, a movie Travis and I both haven't seen, so that might crop up on the schedule sometime. Yeah, keep an ear out for that one. Yeah, and Steven Nesbella went with What Dreams May Come. Go listen to our What Dreams May Come episode, uh, but as was noted in the comments, that's a that's a tough watch. It is. It's heavy and it's also not a great movie. Like it stumbles through some things, which actually makes the kind of experience of watching it heavier. Um, but you and I really like Vincent Ward as an artist. So, you know, yeah, it's worth I, watching just to sort of get a sense like of what Vincent Ward does as a filmmaker. Yeah, go listen to our episode about full thoughts about it. But yeah, it's a it's a lot of movie. Um mm-hmm. it's a lot. Uh so thank you everybody. Always love having these listener shelf picks. And looking forward to the ones next week for Peggy Sue Got Married. Now we're going to do some quick calls to action, but stick around because Travis and I are going to talk about one of our most anticipated movies of the year, Nightmare Alley from Guillermo del Toro. So uh, if you love genre vision, the best way to showcase that love would be to leave a written review and rating on the Apple Podcast Store. You can also rate the show on Spotify. Uh, Those written reviews with ratings, honestly are the best thing for us. They really get the show out there. We have a little chart that tells us where we're tracking uh, for certain categories in iTunes. And every time we get a review, our numbers go up. Yep. But then they go down again. So we have to keep getting reviews consistently if we're going to climb the ranks in the film reviews uh, subcategory on iTunes. Exactly. Or Apple, Apple Podcast, rather. Whatever. It's the same system, basically. Yes. Uh, but what you can do is you can open up the uh, Apple Music or Apple Podcast app on your Mac um, iTunes on your PC, or you can access the Apple podcast app on your iPhone, your iPad and find genre vision there. Uh, seek out the, uh, little pencil and paper icon, the leave a review comment box, and just leave us a, a brief, uh, star rating and a written review. And, um, it will continue to boost us up those rankings and get more eyes and ears on genre vision, which is something that, uh, we would really, really like to happen. Uh, and plus if you leave a review, no matter what you say, we're likely to read it on the next episode. Of the well, I was going to say, man, I mean, I don't know. I, don't, I mean, there is anything. some shit that people could say that, that would prevent them from being read on the show. Yes, but, but you know, but within at, reason, you'll be read on the show. At this point, we have we have read every review that has been submitted on the show. So it's true, even the negative ones, even That's the ones true. that say we're like hacks who have terrible laughs. I I, li- I can't remember what episode that was, but I re-listened to an episode recently and came across that two star review that we read, which was mm-hmm. very fun, um, and that I got. <laughs> I had a little fun moment there. Um, Yes, please, please, please. Those written reviews are worth their weight in gold. Uh, And if you want more genre vision in your life, you can go to patreon.com slash genre vision and become a premium subscriber for just five bucks a month. That will get you access to just untold hours 
of bonus material, uh, including weekly pre-shows. Uh, the pre-shows, we do a whole bunch of scheduling. Honestly, if you've been listening to the pre-shows, you pretty much know what we're going to be doing all the way up until May at this point. And not only do you know that, you know our reasoning for behind it. So you get exactly. our thought process on like how we curate and how we choose films to do on the show. Today, for instance, we did something a little bit different. We kind of did like a genre vision state of the union, you know, sort of talked about you know, how long we've been doing the show and how we feel about it, what we'd like to do differently. So if you want to hear that kind of behind the scenes talk, go to patreon.com slash genre vision, sign up for the premium tier at $5 a month. All right, let's do some currently consuming num, 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 num. because holy hell in a handbasket. Do we have a, I don't know how much time we'll take, but nightmare alley happened to us. So Nightmare Alley, which was released in theaters in December of last year, has finally hit Hulu and HBO Max in the U.S. So it, now that it's on those two platforms, if you're living in the U.S., like, come on, it's time to see Nightmare Alley. And uh, set aside some time because it's a big old honking movie at two and a half hours. But it earns every single second. So earlier uh, last year, I saw the uh, original screen adaptation of Nightmare Alley. I think it's from 1951 starring Tyrone Power, which was a big passion project of his. And everybody told him, like, don't do this. This is like, absolutely, you should not do this movie. It's it's going to destroy your image. And now it's like one of the movies he's most well known for. Uh, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed the 1951 version. I thought it was great. Guillermo del Toro has not only once again proved that he's never made a bad movie. I stick by that. This is one of his greats. It's absolutely in contention for his best movie. I mean... I recently rewatched Shape of Water and sort of like, you know, okay, where's Guillermo del Toro's head at nowadays? Like, is he, has he kind of lost his touch? Like, can he do something this like dark and mean, or is he going to be kind of twee? Cause he has, you know, he's got a penchant for the twee, you know, he's not oh, like, sure. Jean, he's, he's not unlike Jean-Pierre Jeunet in that way. Um, Watch his Hellboy movies. Those, I mean, he, you they're can twee tell. as fuck. Yeah. yeah. And, and, but he understands the, the value and the importance and when to be that nightmare alley is cruel it is fucking brutal oh other than maybe the hangover movies and like his vocal performance and guardians of the galaxy i have not seen a whole lot of bradley cooper i'm not really like hot on him at all i've never like he's not a a, a plus factor for me in a movie holy moly bradley cooper in this I, he's also, it should, he's one of the main producers. He's got a PGA credit on this. Mm -hmm. So he, he obviously had some, some, uh, strong enough creative control on it, but man, if, if, if this is how good he can be, Guillermo, get him in another movie because holy yeah. moly, he's good. Here's the thing. Like when Bradley Cooper was promoting star is born, I was reading interviews with him and I'm like, man, this guy's kind of being a jerk about his movie. He's being kind of a snob, but then you know, this whole conception that I had of him as a movie star succeeded in like basically dissolving thanks to Nightmare Alley. When this movie starts, you don't see Bradley Cooper, the giant movie star, Oscar nominated, like A-lister. Uh, this movie succeeds in stripping all that away. And it does so by having the first few minutes of this guy on screen with no dialogue. So you just see him moving through scenes and performing actions and like basically getting sort of whisked along in the plot without having to utter a single word. And so it it really changed my preconceived notion of who Bradley Cooper was as a performer by just breaking him down to like base elements of acting. And it constructs just such a killer performance from him. I mean, uh, whoa. Well, and and here, here's the here's the even better part. He ain't alone. This cast is fireworks, baby. Uh, this is an army of like just incredible performers. I mean, you, you know, you've got uh, Bradley Cooper. Okay. That leads him to Willem Dafoe, which then leads him to fucking Tony Collette and David Strathairn. Oh my uh, God. David Strathairn. in this uh, is so like, I, I knew the character that he was playing from the original. So as soon as it came on, I was like, Oh, this is great casting for him. And he exceeded that high bar expectation. I was like, he is so good in a small role, a super important role, but a small one. Same thing with Tony Collette, uh, Rooney Mara, Ron Perlman, of course, is in this in some capacity. Yeah. Uh, and then there's Kate Blanchett. Ooh, I think she came out of another dimension or another time to be in this movie. Well, here's the thing. They also, and I continually said this when we were watching it, they lit Kate Blanchett for the gods in this movie. No question. Every uh, shot. 
it, it's one. I know that there's a black and white version of this going around in theaters. And granted, I I don't think it will be as good as the color version because this this movie is beautiful to look at in color well del toro uses color as a storytelling tool oh of course all of his movies like a really he's a really strong color guy you know he oh, yeah. really color code things very heavily in his films and you know this this whole thing with kate blanchett leads bradley cooper's character to get into interactions with a character played by richard jenkins who and then one of richard jenkins's guys is played by holt McCallany, and it's like who next you know, it, it just keeps getting better and better. Well, I mean, but the the reason I do want to see the black and white version is for Kate Blanchett alone, because she like the way they light her is so classic noir, like so aware of the role she's playing, because in a way she's a villain in the movie mm-hmm. in, of sorts. But this is a movie kind of filled with villains like they're 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 the, as far as our protagonists go and her understanding of the smoldering cunning of the character is delectable. Like it just every moment of her on, like there is no question in my mind of the Kate Blanchett movies I've seen. This is top five for sure. Like she, she's incredible. Yeah. It's fucking stunning. So, uh, the scare, the screenplay is credited to, um, Del Toro and Kim Morgan and the dialogue they write is very classically noir, to the, sometimes almost to the point of parody, but every line delivery is exactly how that line needs to be delivered. Oh, yeah. So Blanchett, you know, particularly her, she is saddled with some really heavy, like, noir dialogue, but she understands the melody of how something is supposed to be intonated and, like, the prosody of the dialogue, like... Like nobody else in the movie. It's so incredible. It's, I mean, for, for an, a two and a half hour movie, man, it flew by. It was so good. But it, it, at the same time, it still feels really substantial. Like, you've oh, seen no. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. it's, it's a man, you know, it's that, you know, uh, stick your hand on a hot woman, you know, <laughs> yeah. relativity. <laughs> like yeah. yeah. So, um, <laughs> our deep blue sea references that, you know, the language Travis and I can speak. Um, but, uh no, I mean I mean as a production, my God, the 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 big chunk uh, pretty much like the first hour of the movie takes place with this carnival and the production they did, like that spook house that they run through when they're chasing the geek. Oh my it's like Del Toro it was like I've been waiting to make a carnival fun house my whole life. Mm-hmm. And now I'm going to do it. And it's still, it's wonderfully thematic because it's all devil themed. So there's all this like, you know, look upon yourself, ye sinner, as as uh, uh, Stanton Carlisle is, is running through and seeing Funhouse mirrors. There's great, uh, there's there's so many good things about that, like with the with the different like carnival bills and posters and stuff like you know what what are what kind of man are you or something oh yeah i mean it's 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 directly thematic i mean this is a movie that really wants to be about its themes you know it's not going to let you forget about what the central themes are that's del toro baby he knows how to do that it's del toro but it's also noir you know it's also sort of um well part and parcel with the whole subgenre well because del toro spoke about when you know doing the the press tours for this movie he spoke about noir he's like people think noir is just you know Bogart and private detectives and, yeah. and, you know, that kind of stuff. And he's like, no, what noir is, is the dark side of the American experience through, right. you know, f- through using certain filmmaking techniques and, and storytelling structures, but that it should be about what is dark about America. I mean, there, there's definitely, I hate to say this. I don't like saying it, but I think it's true. Nightmare Alley in some regard does feel like Del Toro thinking about not directly Trump, but how can a con man really take us over? No, I mean, it was like facing the crowd in that way. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's, and it's, and it's also related to, um, the Lorraine Scafari movie or Lorraine Scafari movie hustlers. Sure. Yeah. Where it's like, we're all doing the dance, right? I mean, it's, it's really about what's the con and there's so many great things about, okay, you, you know, everybody's running a con on everybody, but the thing is, you can't start believing in your own con mm-hmm. that as soon as you start believing what you're doing is real. And this is all through the thematics of a, a cold reading parlor trick type uh, uh, mentalism act is as soon as you start believing your own bullshit, 
you're done. Well, I love the contrast of the mentalism and the cold reading versus the psychology. Sure. Which yeah. is, you know, in some ways, especially in this era, you know, it's it was often akin to cold reading, you know, where that's I like, mean, yeah. oh, the cold reading could immediately say like, oh, well, you had issues with your father. Yeah, well, psycho- the psychologist is going to feel the same exact way, like, you know, oh, very yeah, shortly after upon meeting, you know, especially like Bradley Cooper's character, like the psychologist is going to know. And it's a very like old style of analysis where it's almost like hypnotherapy, where Bradley Cooper is on the sofa laying down and closing his eyes. And oh, man, it's it's a rapturous experience. This movie rules. We could just sit here and just talk because I, I, when you're talking about it, it's like, oh, yeah, when David Strathern first does the the act on him. And mm-hmm. and he's doing this stuff. And you even said when we were watching, it's like, oh, Cooper's seeing him do real magic. And I said, is it? What is magic? Yeah. yeah it's like, what is magic? Is it, you know, and, and you said it's an act. It's a con. Like, and and that afterwards, like, because David Strathern says all that, it's like, oh, you have a problem with your father. You know, I see, I see your father and, and you're angry at him or something like that. And Bradley Cooper is amazing. He's like, how'd you know all that about my father? And David Strathern's like, yeah, it's pretty easy. Like everybody has a father, you know, like boy, your age you're going to have issues with your father. Like I, you know, you can, it's about knowing how to read people Mm -hmm. and this evolution of like how he gets the act and then does it on his own and then comes into contact with Kate Blanchett to increase how they can con people out of the act. It's so fucking, Oh my God, I want to watch it now. Like it's so good. It's, I know it technically came out last year, but I didn't see it then. So like, that's not how I'm counting it right now. Nightmare Alley is my favorite movie of the year. Stunning. Uh, this is certainly one of the best movies I've seen in the last couple of years. Um, yes. I recommend that everybody watch it. Um, I'm flabbergasted. I, I want to see the uh, previous adaptation like immediately. Oh yes, but, like, I I've, I've also again. I've also already like contrasted like h- how the two films differ in adaptation, and the Del Toro one's meaner and truer to the novel. Watch Nightmare Alley. Do it if you have HBO Max or Hulu. Stop listening to this and go watch Nightmare Alley. It's an absolute treasure of a film. Uh, Well, we will continue our genre romance theme month next week with the Wachowskis Bound, which Travis and I have both never seen. I'm really excited to watch this. I hear great things about it. I'm stoked. It's I'm super stoked. Like I've heard nothing but good things about it. Honestly, Uh, anything with Gina Gershon in it after um, after Showgirls. Anything with Jennifer Tilly in it anything I'll any watch. ever yeah <laughs> yes. so uh, you don't you don't have to convince me on that <laughs> so you uh we'll see we'll see how lascivious i am next week about jennifer tilly uh when we do bound we hope you'll be back with us as always want to thank you so much for listening i'm drew deach i'm travis newton and we'll see you next week right here on genre vision genre vision